conspiracy to hide UFO evidence at the highest levels of the U.S. government? Or is it all just a myth? If you want to know the truth about UFOs, Wright Patterson Air Force Base would be the place to go. Join us as the UFO Files uncovers the facts behind the legend of Hangar 18. July 1947, Roswell, New Mexico. Wreckage of an unknown craft litters a field measuring almost a mile long and hundreds of yards wide. The U.S. Army sends trucks filled with soldiers to the location. Their mission, to secure and retrieve everything from the crash site. The military initially calls the craft a flying disc in a press release. The Army quickly recants the UFO story and a press conference is scheduled in which the media is told that the wreckage is nothing more than a weather balloon. But according to many UFO researchers, at the same time that the press is distracted with supposedly fake debris, the actual Roswell wreckage and possibly other retrieved items are taken under military control. They are surreptitiously flown almost 1,500 miles away to a military base in Dayton, Ohio, named Wright Field. According to UFO legend, its precise destination is a hangar on the base, Hangar 18. We know that stuff got shipped to Wright because of the testimony of the people who were involved in the shipments on both ends. A declassified FBI document dated July 8, 1947, the same week as the Roswell crash, also provides ties to Wright Field. The object found resembles a high-altitude weather balloon with a radar reflector. But that telephonic conversation between their office and Wright Field had not borne out this belief. Disc and balloon being transported to Wright Field by special plane for examination. Soon after the Roswell debris arrives, the class of 1947 from the military's elite airman training facility, the prestigious Air War College, is flown to Wright Field to investigate. One of the officers on scene is a battle-tested hero of World War II, a fighter pilot whose reputation earns him the nickname Black Mac. But nothing would prepare Marion Magruder and his classmates for what they would witness at Wright Field. It would change their lives forever. He saw metal that was very pliable, that you could wrinkle up in your hands. And then it would go right back into shape, and it was very light, and yet you couldn't tear it apart. He saw parts of wreckage of what were extraterrestrial craft. He saw bodies, and he also saw a living being. He said that it was childlike, very thin, with an oversized head and long arms uh, with four digits. My father referred to the fact that we killed it. I'm sure we did not do it on purpose, but they were experimenting and obviously we did not know how to make this entity live, but this being did die. And the way he referred to it is, we killed him. According to his son, Mark, Lieutenant Colonel Magruder and his classmates are sworn to secrecy under threat of court-martial. Because of this, he keeps his secret for 50 years, even from his family. But in 1997, his health fading, Black Mac begins to open up to those closest to him. I said, Dad, are you finally going to tell us what you know so that we will know? And at the time, he said it was an awesome secret to carry all of his life to know that there were more than us on this earth and to not be able to tell anybody.
I've never told this story on TV before, and it's difficult to do it now because I want my father's legacy to be as honorable as his life was. And it's very important to me that you know that I'm telling you the truth as he absolutely knew it to be. He just needed to let us know, his children know, that we weren't alone. Black Mac Magruder's story is not an isolated tale. In fact, for more than half a century, similar stories have surfaced about UFO wreckage, alien bodies, secret underground cryogenic chambers, and a mysterious hangar at the base. Wright Field would grow and be renamed Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but questions about the base and its legendary Hangar 18 would remain. Hangar 18 has always been a mystery at Patterson Air Force Base. If you want to know the truth about UFOs, about the craft, the debris, probably the records, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, in my estimation, would be the place to go. If these claims are true, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, one of the largest and most important in America's military, could be ground zero for recovered UFO material. All the information I have from all my sources says it was shipped here, and the people who actually worked at Wright-Patterson, who actually wore a uniform here, said it was here. Wreckage, entire pieces of the craft, and whole sections of the craft, bodies were brought in, in fact, bodies were brought in on a regular basis from a number of different crashes from Roswell on. Not only was debris from many UFO crashes allegedly shipped to the base, but from the late 1940s until the end of the 1960s, all reports regarding UFOs were conducted at Wright-Patterson for the military's official UFO investigation, Project Blue Book. Wright-Patterson evolved into one of the most talked about bases in UFO lore. However, the Air Force's description of the base is much different. Really what makes Wright-Patterson unique is we are by and large focused on tomorrow. What is tomorrow's Air Force going to look like? What kind of airplanes will we fly? What kind of weapons will be on those aircraft? What kind of technology will be in the cockpit? We have the Air Force Research Laboratory here we buy all of the aircraft in the United States Air Force through the offices that are here. We are responsible for all of the flight tests, all of the science and technology. We're also responsible for all of the major intelligence that's done for air and space. Some of the research that goes on in technology may be classified because we're trying to protect the technology that we develop to make sure that we provide our soldiers and our airmen the, the best advantage. Until the early 1990s, much of this scientifically advanced work was done by the Foreign Technology Division, or FTD, which many researchers believe is the key to understanding Wright-Patterson's role in UFO history. The Foreign Technology Division was the Air Force unit that was responsible for uh, scientific and technical intelligence as, uh, as it applied to the air and space and missile uh, capability of mainly the Soviet Union. They were there to prevent technological surprise. Uh, they were the experts in the bad guys' equipment. Wright-Patterson has a history of duplicating Russian equipment, German equipment, and reverse engineering it. Why would they not do the same thing with extraterrestrial technology? And so there's no question in my mind that's exactly what we're doing. Coming up, a second major UFO recovery and a second secret trip to Hangar 18. You saw two bodies through the porthole slumped over. March 25th. 1948, Aztec, New Mexico. What starts as a normal day for local oil workers 
turns into an encounter with the unknown. As they approach the western edge of the mesa, a large silver object grabs their attention. When the oil workers got to the mesa, there was a disk approximately 100 feet in diameter. Because the ship is found intact, it appears to be a landing as opposed to a crash. The witnesses I talked to, both Ken Farley and Doug Nolan, young men at the time, would not enter the craft. Bill Ferguson, the foreman, uh, the more senior gentleman, uh, was yelling at the, the workers to get away from it. Except for a shattered porthole, there isn't any immediate sign of damage. Doug Nolan reported to me he saw two bodies through the porthole slumped over. Within hours, trucks arrive, supposedly from Camp Hale, Colorado. It appears the U.S. government has another UFO incident to contend with. Having learned from their mistakes at Roswell, the Army quickly takes control of the situation. Roswell, nine months earlier, had been sort of botched by putting it on the front page of many newspapers around the country. I think the military had really fine-tuned their skills on going in and retrieving a down-flying disc or UFO. The secrecy started immediately upon the military's arrival at the crash site. They separated the uh, locals and uh, reminded them of their patriotic duty for the United States and swore them to secrecy. 58 years ago, you told to shut up for national security, you did it because you respected and trusted the government. The military wanted that craft immediately and they would do whatever it took to get it out of there. According to the eyewitnesses, the Army recovers between 14 and 16 badly burned alien bodies from the craft. The recovery team reportedly brings both the ship and the alien corpses to a local safe house, away from the media. Take it to the nearest military base where you can control access to it. And then you arrange to ship it to an appropriate place, depending on what you want done. But again, Wright-Patterson would be the eventual repository. Because of the number of alien bodies at Aztec, it is considered one of the most significant UFO retrievals to date. But UFO researchers say there are many other cases tied to Wright Field. October 1947, Paradise Valley, Arizona. May 1953, Kingman, Arizona. June 1953, Laredo, Texas. And December 5, 1965, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania are only a few of the alleged flying saucer recoveries in the U.S. alone. No matter where a UFO lands, it seems all roads lead back to Wright-Patterson and Hangar 18. The right path was kind of a graveyard for some of these things and uh, probably put them in a holding pattern until technology got to where they could look at them better. But despite countless books and the public interest in UFOs, there was no official confirmation about alien aircraft at Hangar 18. Eventually, attention shifted away from Wright Patterson. Interest was revived, however, in 1978, when UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield gave a speech at the annual Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON Symposium, coincidentally held in Dayton, Ohio, Wright-Patterson's home. Len was doing things in this field that nobody else had done. He actually had developed a number of people that were leaking information to him. They were given testimony on things that they had seen and done. Uh, not just one person, but a whole entourage of people that he developed a, a trust where people knew they could trust him and, and he wouldn't expose them. 
and they could give him the information and he could correlate it with others and determine what's real and what isn't. Stringfield wrote several books on the subject of UFO crashes and their retrievals. Because of the secrecy involved, many of his sources didn't want their full names published for fear of losing their top secret government jobs. Among the stories of wreckage being stored at Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson was a tale about a Navy pilot identified only as PJ, who, along with several others, accidentally entered a restricted hangar. For a brief 30 seconds, a disc-shaped object of metallic color, 15 feet wide and 8 feet deep, was seen. I cannot confirm anything other than it was there. According to Stringfield's research, they were confronted by the guards and quickly escorted out of the hangar. Once outside, we had reassured each other that the good old U.S. had developed, or had all along, flying saucers in service. As these stories started surfacing, other witnesses came forward. UFO researcher and Aberdeen, Washington police detective James Clarkson located June Crane, a former employee of Wright-Patterson from the Roswell era. She agreed to sit down with him for an audio interview in 1997, and Clarkson has consented to allow the History Channel to air this interview for the first time on television. Crane's story dates back to the early 1950s. According to the documents she supplied to Clarkson, she was a clerk typist with access to top secret information. One afternoon, a lieutenant surprised her with a piece of unusual metal. He threw it on my desk and he says, June, you're a good wrecker. Tear that thing apart. Break that up. And I took it and I bent it and I twisted it and I laid laid it back down and it went got right back the same shape so it's it's fairly thick but it doesn't weigh anything but it had no weight at all it was like a feather I, I said well what is it and he says piece of a spaceship he said I just come back from New Mexico and I found it next from debris to aliens June Crane's story takes a surprising turn he called them little green men. He, then he described them as a greenish blue. And they were four foot tall, and they were dead. It is the early 1950s. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is at the center of America's high-tech war effort and the Air Force's most sophisticated technology. It is also home to the government's crash retrieval program, which these declassified documents describe as designed to capture for study non-U.S. space objects or objects of unknown origin. It was codenamed Project Moondust. Items retrieved by Moondust were then shipped to the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson. Project Moondust had to do really with us collecting space junk, things that would uh, be falling out of the sky. When a Soviet satellite fell, when a piece of a Soviet missile or a space launch vehicle landed in an area that we could get to, it was important to, to glean as much of this equipment as possible so that we could study its technical makeup, its structure and the components and so forth. It was not uncommon for examples of uh, foreign air, space and missile technology to be brought back here to Wright-Patterson, uh, even fragments of them, if that's all that uh, could be located. The situation is the same. Here's an unknown aerial vehicle coming down. Let's keep people away from it. Let's grab the wreckage ourselves and let's lie about it so nobody knows what we've done. Standard practice. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about airplanes or saucers. 
One Wright Patterson employee who may have had access to information about these recoveries was clerk typist June Crane. According to Crane, her top secret clearance allowed her to witness high-level base information, including, she claims, classified files on UFO crash retrievals. In 1997, Crane told UFO researcher James Clarkson her story of downed alien aircraft. For the first time on television, the History Channel is airing that interview. There was three times that I am aware of. I won't vouch for the fourth one because I wouldn't. Are these, these three crashes that you heard about while you worked at Wright Patterson? Well, one was the Roswell and then there was two other ones. So as of 1952, they knew about three crashes right, right, of vehicles that were probably extraterrestrial. Right, right. And then the one where they brought the two men into Wright Patterson Air Force Base and put them in the icebox. I didn't see it because nobody was allowed to see it. Okay, when two little men... He, he called them little green men. He, then he described them as a greenish blue. And they were four foot tall and they were dead. And we're talking about non-humans. Non-humans, right. According to Clarkson, Crane had kept her silence for 45 years. At the time, she had been forced to sign a confidentiality agreement and was liable for a $10,000 fine. But by 1997, Crane changed her mind. In an email from Clarkson to UFO Files, he explains June had told him, I'm 72 years old. What are they going to do, shoot me or put me in prison? I think I can handle either one. June passed away in 1998, but her testimony would appear to provide witness to alien bodies at Wright-Patterson. According to many in the UFO field, she is not alone. I have talked to a number of people and interviewed a smaller number at some depth who have said that there were bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and bodies recovered from Roswell. And remember, Wright-Patterson did have the capability of providing low-temperature storage for biological specimens. They had an anthropoid laboratory there, you know, apes and monkeys and stuff like that. That's a great cover for aliens as well. Additional stories of aliens at Wright-Patterson can be found in the papers of Leonard Stringfield, the ufologist who specialized in crash retrieval. Most of Stringfield's eyewitnesses preferred to remain anonymous or simply go by their initials. One of them, an unnamed former naval intelligence officer, claims to have been present when alien bodies arrived in 1953. I saw the bodies at Wright Patterson. I was in the right place at the right time when the crates arrived at night by DC-7. Stringfield also interviewed an anonymous army officer who claimed to have witnessed another group of four alien bodies being brought to Wright Patterson in 1957. According to the general, the four bodies, approximately five feet in height, were sent to
are about four bolts that are about 100 by 100 feet. We found out that these things exist. The question is, what was in them? I'm convinced that the stuff that was recovered from Roswell and other crashes was put in these vaults. UFO researchers have long heard reports of such a network underneath the base. But Collins' work may provide a more specific view of those tunnels. One that helps construct a diagram of what may exist at the base. According to his research, there is a Building 18 complex instead of a Hangar 18. The structure he found that fit the description is the neighboring building, number 23. Collins claims it was previously known as Hangar 23. Now the way I understand it, that back in the early 50s sometime, perhaps between 51 and 53, a craft was brought in here. The uh, floor of the uh, Hangar 23 was removed and this craft was put in the basement of the hangar and then the floor was covered over the craft. Uh, and then there was a vault area in building 18F with a tunnel that was constructed and built over to hangar 23. While it is possible that building 23 was the legendary hangar 18, most researchers have continued to focus on the importance of the underground tunnels. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is honeycombed with below ground level facilities. These pits were dug in various configurations and were deep enough to where if covered over would have made an ideal remote examination laboratory for somebody trying to examine alien artifacts that had been recovered elsewhere. By interviewing various Air Force personnel who were supposedly granted access to the top secret underground vault, Collins felt he was able to confirm many of the rumors. The biggest kept secret was the huge cryogenics uh, networks that were required to support and preserve these bodies. And I understand it was quite extensive. There were huge cryogenic uh, storage tubes that uh, these so-called three foot four or three foot six aliens were kept in these canisters under cryogenic temperatures. What actually lies beneath Wright-Patterson may be impossible to confirm. The Air Force Base operates under the highest security, keeping access to the base and these vaults secret from almost everyone, even their own. The secrecy goes all the way to the top. It's a question of absolutely the highest level of classification that exists in the United States government as far as I know. A formerly classified memo from mid-July 1947 points to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover showing immense interest in a retrieved craft and his frustration about being kept out of the loop. We must insist on full access to disk recovery. The Army grabbed it and would not let us have it for cursory examination. The memo was written just days after the Roswell, New Mexico wreckage was taken to Wright Field. If J. Edgar Hoover couldn't get access to the contents of Hangar 18, how high did the secrecy go? In a 1994 interview with Larry King on TNT, Senator Barry Goldwater detailed his attempt to visit Hangar 18. I think at Wright-Patterson, if you could get into certain places, you'd find out what the Air Force and the government does know about UFOs. Reportedly, a spaceship landed. It was all hushed up. I called Curtis LeMay, and I said, General, I know we have a room at Wright-Patterson where you put all the secret stuff. Could I go in there? Well, I've never heard General LeMay get mad, but he got madder than hell at me. Cussed me out and said, don't ever ask me that question again. How much was there, we don't know. Whether it was just documents, or specimens, or pieces, nobody knows. But the story dates back to Goldwater, and I think there's almost no question that it's a very true story. Next, unexplained lights over Wright-Patterson have Dayton on alert. 
are they proof that there are UFOs on the base? Two policemen chased it. They felt it was heading for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They are schematics, once classified as secret. Designs of a craft that appears to be a flying saucer. Various unconfirmed stories have emerged of disc-shaped vehicles being developed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But these declassified government documents from 1955 reveal that the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Wright-Patterson had in fact begun work on a disc-shaped craft named Project Silverbug. It was a circular aircraft about 35 feet in diameter, had a crew of one pilot, and uh, was capable of a vertical takeoff at about 2,000 miles an hour. There are witnesses who swear it eventually flew, but most accounts state that Silverbug probably remained on the drawing board. But Project Silverbug wasn't the only example of the military's interest in disc-shaped vehicles. Eleven years later, a former pilot who was walking through the hangars at Wright-Patterson during a reunion of his squadron, the Flying Tigers, says he accidentally saw a similarly designed aircraft. Mr. Warren Botts, who had an inquisitive mind at the time, was going through these different hangar bays. When he got to hangar number four, bay E, he went through the doorway there. There was an armed guard at the facility who did not see him at, in the beginning. He started approaching the port main landing gear to investigate it, and that's where the guard stopped him, questioned his authority, and told him he was not supposed to be in there. But he did see a very large monster, his words, of an aircraft that was 116 feet in diameter, at least 12 feet off the hangar floor. Although the name of that specific project has never been disclosed, the U.S. military was apparently interested in a craft that could have looked like this. With Wright-Patterson's history of reverse engineering foreign technology, is it possible that some of the military's advances were gained from retrieved UFOs? I think we've made a great deal of effort to learn bits and pieces based on the, both the recovered wreckage and the instrument data from tracking UFOs. I don't think we've yet learned how to duplicate that technology overall, that is to build something that could fly the way saucers or motherships do. If you're given Christopher Columbus an unlimited budget in 1493 and a nuclear submarine and say, Chris, is your reward, here's this great nuclear submarine and an unlimited budget, I need two more of these. Could he have built one? Not a chance. Summer, 1980. Mysterious lights fill the night skies above Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Newspapers and countless eyewitnesses report the aircraft was unlike anything they'd ever seen. The main reports we saw was the object was moving up and down, was brightly lit, it had hovered for long periods of time, and some people said it seemed to disappear over Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But the biggest thing that gave us what we felt was the conclusive evidence that it was something from Wright Field was when the two Middletown policemen chased it. They chased it for a long ways towards Dayton, Ohio, and then lost it in an area that they felt was heading for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Wilhelm, a retired Army Master Sergeant and UFO investigator, suspected the military may have been secretly testing the newly developed Harrier jet on the base. The British-designed craft combines the vertical abilities of a helicopter and the forward thrust of a conventional jet. After releasing his findings to the media, Wilhelm was quickly contacted by the military. I got a phone call from a major from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and he asked me a lot of questions, and at the very end, he did say, I cannot make any comments, Mr. Wilhelm, but all I can say is you've done your homework. So a lot of things that people think they see that's strange doesn't mean that it's a craft from another world. Most of the time, it's our military developing some of our technology, which we need very badly. 
and it's the reason why they don't say a whole lot. And I commend them for them, and I back them up 100%. The Harrier incident raises another possibility about activities at Wright-Patterson. Perhaps many of the legends about Hangar 18 are actually a cover-up for top-secret military programs. I think it's important to keep in mind that the government, in association with Air Force OSI Counterintelligence Division, would really like to extend the alien myth as a cover to hide their own deep black programs. Well, it means that they want everyone to believe that what you're seeing out there is extraterrestrial and we do not have the technology to duplicate what we're seeing in the skies. I think to the extent that they can confuse or disinform folks about flying discs and make it look like a terrestrial innovation, the more they'll do that. It's in the government's best interest to distribute disinformation if you want to keep a secret secret. The debate over Hangar 18 and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base may never be completely resolved. I would say upward of over 80% convinced that it's true. There was wreckage there, there were bodies brought there. Research was done here up to maybe 81 or 82, and then they packed everything up and moved it because of security lakes. That's when all the little stories about Green Men uh, ceased, about that time frame. Most researchers speculate that any work being done involving UFOs at Wright-Patterson may have been relocated to another top-secret base, Area 51, the mysterious airfield hidden in the Nevada desert. Area 51 developed because of its location, away from anything. And Wright-Patterson is in Dayton, Ohio. It's in the middle of a, a major town. So I think uh, Area 51 would have been the ideal location. Officially, the government won't confirm that any actual UFO wreckage exists at all. Despite the denials, there are government documents that indicate that wreckage from Roswell and other mysterious crashes were shipped to Wright-Patterson for purposes of examining the debris. Government programs existed that show the airbase had an interest in gathering any foreign space vehicles it could locate. In this documentary, you will see miraculous UFO footage that has been authenticated by top UFO. The documentary featured an extensive summary of the footage, the canisters containing the footage, an expert analysis from the likes of Stanton Friedman. One film expert noted in the documentary that the footage came in an old Soviet canister that had information labeled on it that was consistent with info written directly on the film reel. The numbers on the film's header matched the canisters they came. The header of the film had the crest of the KGB on it and the term for TOP secret is shown in the first few seconds of this footage and image to the right. Having real looking alien footage is one thing. But including the original film real canisters means you are extremely close to proving 100 authenticity. This is something that has traditionally lacked in other more popular alien videos such as the widely known alien autopsy or the alien interview videos. 3. Several KGB documents In the documentary, several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic along with credible testimony from a former Soviet KGB operative who claims to know about the event. At first everyone believed that those debris were part of some novelty aircraft manufactured in the United States or England, said Pavel Klimchenkov, a former KGB operative, but having done some measurements material analysis, we came to the conclusion that none of the domestic or foreign manufacturers known to us could have produced this apparatus, at least not in the conditions existing on this planet. Along with Pavel's testimony, authentic KGB top secret documents were obtained by the filmmakers allegedly costing them $10.000. The documents described in detail a crash site recovery operation of a disc-shaped object and organic remains. Based on the credible testimony, KGB documents, expert film analysis and the general good feeling one gets when watching this interesting crash site video, it is safe to assume that this film indeed may be authentic. What about the autopsy? This footage will be posted in our second part article along with thoughts and analysis. Actors. 
training exercises, skepticism. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. One skeptical viewpoint suggests that the object's thickness is far too small to support any would-be alien pilot. The craft's outer edge is seen on the image is only 12 to 36 inches. However, it is not necessarily indicative of the overall thickness of the craft. The image was taken from the only part in the video sequence where the craft's edge is visible, and since the camera never goes behind, there is no way to tell how much depth the craft may have on the other side. Additionally, if you consider the side facing us may be actually be the bottom, we can easily see that this craft can easily fit the traditional flying saucer shape as demonstrated by the below images. In this documentary they claim that, since they only were able to acquire four canisters of film, more film footage of this incident is available. Such as the entire digging, cleanup, and inside the craft investigation. To this date, almost a decade after it went public, no other videos have surfaced. A UFO crash site allegedly filmed by the Russian KGB in March of 1969 in the Sverdlovsk region of Russia. The footage was later obtained by documentary filmmakers who then published the movie, The Secret KGB UFO Files A film expert noted in the documentary that the film came in an old Soviet film can and the numbers on the film's header matched the cans they came in. The header of the film has the crest of the KGB on it and the term for TOP secret. An autopsy of the alleged pilot of the UFO is seen in the documentary film. Soviet doctors examined the burnt torso of the entity and it is revealed that the three doctors died one week later all from cerebral hemorrhages. Death certificates are presented as proof. Several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. UFO aliens may have helped build pyramids of Giza says. Cairo University Archaeologist Head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen in December 2010 had told an audience that there might be truth to the theory that aliens helped the ancient Egyptians build the oldest of pyramids, the Pyramids of Giza. On being further questioned by Mr. Marek Novak, a delegate from Poland as to whether the pyramid might still contain alien technology or even the UFO with its structure, Dr. Shaheen was vague and replied I cannot confirm or deny this, but there is something inside the pyramid that is not of this world. Delegates to the conference on ancient Egyptian architecture were left shocked, however Dr. Shaheen had refused to comment further or elaborate on his UFO and alien related statements. Down below is 90s The Secret KGB UFO Files documentary, that deals with the fact that Russian had already discovered the tomb of alien humanoid in Egypt and something is beneath the pyramid. The secret KGB UFO files documentary interestingly supporting the head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen claim as well. Actually ancient Egyptian writings very often talk of beings from the sky, the sky opening and bright lights coming down to teach them technology and give them wisdom. Many pictures and symbols resemble UFOs and aliens. Possibly aliens built the Great Pyramid. And these solid long-lasting construction techniques were adopted by the Egyptians. Ancient Egyptian legends tell of Tebzepi, or the first time.
This is described as an age when sky gods came down to earth and raised the land from mud and water. They supposedly flew through the air in flying boats and brought laws and wisdom to man through a royal line of pharaohs. And of course, this was all thrown out the window when Christianity came along. Keep in mind that the gods were the one and only religion that there was. No other conflicting beliefs? Why? Well because it was fact, not faith. The modern church would have you believe that's it's just a myth. But you have to ask yourself on the edge of Oakham Razor, what truly indeed is more likely? There has always been the question. How did the Egyptians feed and care for the 100,000 s slaves that it would have taken to build the ancient structures like that of the pyramids in Egypt? One minute it is a very backwards country and almost overnight a highly advanced and technological culture sprung into existence. We now have the answer to that very question and evidence that the Egyptians had help extraterrestrial help at that. Thanks to Russia, the KGB and a top secret project called Project ISIS. Astrophysicist, neurologist and science advisor and advanced propulsion system gained access to the files of Project ISIS. This was a top secret project brought about by KVG concerning the discovery of the Tomb of the Visitor in 1961. Up until Sci-Fi purchased this exclusive footage from an agent of the Russian Mafia, it had never been seen outside the top secret facilities of the KGB. Sci-Fi showed it one time on television and as it stands today, no evidence of this film or the project is available. Except what we have copies of here given to us by a client that had taped the original show. This video is a, a, a powerful documentary with actual footage filmed by the KGB and verified by specialists in the field. Authentic film footage. If we can somehow bring attention back on Project ISIS and prove it out, it will change the history of the beginning of the civilization of man. During the Cold War. Nikita Khrushchev was determined to show the world that communism was superior over the democracy. As he realized that it would be too costly to compete with the U.S. in the space race, Khrushchev chose to go the other route. Having over 300,000 agents in the secret police and espionage organizations he focused most of this resource on alternative science, such as paranormal phenomena, psotromedic weapons, biogenerators and mind-altering machines. 1920s during the Stalinist regime, a dark room was created where the KGB conducted psotronic weapons research on prisoners sentenced to die in political dissidence. After 1936 these files were transferred to the secret archives of the KGB, continuing on with their paranormal research. Khrushchev achieved great success with his biogenerators and machines to alter human minds, which worried, naturally, the United States knowing that the Soviet Union was there to conquer and overthrow. Russia, being that its borders surrounded the largest landmass of the world, had the largest amount of UFO sightings. If they could capture one of these flying objects and reverse engineer it they could have the greatest advanced aeronautical designs. They got lucky in January 1986 when a spacecraft crashed in Dalgorsk but remained intact. The craft was back engineered and the process was quite successful. But to achieve the most superior advancement in global domination, they went in search for something that was only a rumor or legend. The Chamber of Knowledge in Egypt. If the legends were true, storehouse of knowledge left behind by ancient visitors from outer space was concealed in the Great Pyramid. A team of archaeologists were composed of Egyptologists from the Russian Soviet Academy of Science, was sent to Egypt. The fearing that the CIA would learn of this expedition, the Kremlin operated with complete secrecy. By the late 1950s Egypt accounted for 43% of all the Soviet aid for third world nations. When they started the ISIS project the Soviet military personnel in Egypt was estimated over 20,000. The heavy military presence was used to disguise the efforts of the mission scientists headquartered in Cairo. They would operate under the guise of Arab peasants or Russian officers. To speed things up, in 1959 the KGB recruited professional informationalists to wiretap Egyptian officials. This paid of in July 24, 1960 when a conversation was recorded that would then change myth into reality. The official had been given a call that two Bedouin had stumbled upon the tomb of the visitor. The Bedouin were in the hospital and kept repeating, the visitor God. At this moment in time, 
Project ISIS became top priority and all efforts were made to immediately follow up by having the Bedouin show them where they had found this tomb. SEIFI was able to purchase several documents and film footage as to the KGB documentations of their findings. Taken out of Egypt and brought to the secret facility of the KGB was this. Memo to high-ranking KGB official. My agents had secured the notes of one of the scientists working on the tomb of the visitor findings. Another was the inventory of contents taken from the tomb as follows. Location of finding. Undisclosed, 15 crates of relics, one partially mummified body, one stone sarcophagus, eight hieroglyphic samples. Old report from a project scientist that was one of the first to enter the tomb. During the inspection of the wall segment we noted that a strange magnet repulsive force seemed to be emanating from the rock. We were unable to find any scientific explanation cryptologist report. Partial decoded message on tomb wall indicating a prophecy of the return of the winged gods. The Kremlin took the cryptologist report very seriously. KGB was ordered to determine target locations e planets, stars, galaxies. They had to duplicate the stars as they would have been over Giza thousands of years ago. They finally found it, in the stars and constellation of Orion during the year 10,500 BC. Although it was possible that the builders could have been working off plans of a time before the pyramids was constructed this was proven not to be the case. Metal and synthetic materials of tomb were determined to be of unknown origin and the tomb was carbon dated giving it a dating of 10,500 BC meaning the pyramid had to have been made at 10,500 BC. Kins of film were purchased by SEIFI through the Russian Mafia agent which originally came from the maximum security archives of the KGB. These kins contain film of KGB filming the process of the tomb and sarcophagus being opened. Sci-Fi had this film analyzed before purchasing by experts in this field. Finding no evidence of fraud, SEIFI purchased cans of film. The documentary is in black and white showing soldiers entering the tomb without gas masks. As they opened the sarcophagus, you can see toxic fumes escaping and the reaction of the soldiers as they were being affected. It also shows the mummy contained inside. The film shows the soldiers leaving the tomb fast and then a chemical warfare specialist team comes in with protective clothing. There is talk from one that was there in the tomb, that the energy inside, during the first days of exploration was very very high. They also had a team of psychics go in and do some special readings of the tomb. It later goes on to show the KGB and Bedouin loading trucks with crates to be shipped back to Russia. According to KGB documents, Researchers began to wonder if the pyramid was designed for one particular purpose. They thought it was possibly a machine, being that it was designed like a three-dimensional triangular depiction of a hemisphere. Their thoughts were there must have been a reason why it was designed for resonating with the planet. Their thoughts went to a prism and that the pyramids have powers to alter the cosmic rays, that the pyramids are huge prisms capable of concentrating energy capturing light from the stars which would initiate a process which would turn the pyramid into an interstellar transmitter. The three pyramids and SPHNIX could be integral parts of an immense machine designed by alien engineers linked by a master control mechanism inside the Great Pyramids. They noted that the passageway goes to main chamber. And above the sarcophagus was a tunnel of star shaft. They reason that when a specific star alignment occurs a streak of energy goes down the shaft. Scientists speculated that the radiant energy hitting the sarcophagus could initiate something similar to a cold fusion reaction. The prism structure of the pyramid would then magnify and transfer to the corresponding pyramids. A unifed beam of energy could erupt creating a cosmic beacon used by alien starship for future navigaton. According to ancient legends all around the world, they all have the same thing in common. The visitors were like men but more like gods. They were giants. They traveled among the stars. They brought us the knowledge. Legends of the first emperors of China were called the sons of heaven and made the first pyramids of China. Mexico and Yucatan have similar legends. Star walkers can be found throughout Egyptian texts and s. American folklore. The visitors are described as the giants man slash gods giants or titans. And it seems.
All cultures may be traced to a single parent civilization could it be E.T.? Later on in the documentary, it shows them working on the mummy attempting to give it a face and identity. A computer projection of the mummy was made as it laid in the sarcophagus. Experts that were there to observe the floor scenic reconstruction of the face described to sci-fi that if they had not been there themselves, they would not have believed what the face revealed after reconstruction. When skull and face was completed, it showed a humanoid type large cranium large eyes, small chin. Small teeth but not earth humanoid but some being that had to have been extraterrestrial. Later, using underground radar technology, the KBG found a passageway under the tomb of the visitor directly below was a large chamber. They believed they found the chamber of knowledge, but was afraid to open the tomb, thinking it could be a Trojan horse capable of blowing up the entire planet. They decided to seal the tomb, wipe away the location of the tomb and close the project. It seemed however that all were affected by the discovery. Some had personality changes. Some disappeared entirely others committed suicide and others no longer could support their old religious beliefs. The first official report of sightings, that we are aware of, was by King Tutkrimaniai about 3400 years ago. Sightings continued through the ages. Sightings seemed to pick up with man mastered the skies. But when we conquered the inner workings of the atom, the aliens of Orion stepped up their observation with an explosion of UFO sightings that continue up to the present. UFO abduction reports began to sweep around the world in the early 60s. A pattern was developing with nearly all abductees reporting physical examinations, insertion of objects, and artificial inseminations. Many women abductees believed they were being impregnated to give birth to alien hybrids. In the last decade reports such as these have risen dramatically. It may be highly likely that the genetic colonization program that started back in the ancient times has resumed. The question was asked could they be cloning themselves by implanting their alien genes into human na? Are humans being transformed into an alien species through genetic engineer? The ancient Egyptians have always said that our DNA came from the heavens and that someday they would return. Did the KGB discover the truth in the chamber of knowledge about the true agenda of the Yet? And what was discovered on the wall of the tomb of the visitor prophesies that they would return. But when? Secrets cannot be contained. Not even KGB secrets. A group of scientists, computer programs, doctors, etc. shortly after the discovery of the tomb of the visitor, came together to discuss the possibilities of this discovery. They fully believed that the visitor was none other than Osiris, the alien king. Thus they gave themselves the name, the followers, based off the followers of Horus in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. According to Egyptian beliefs a family of gods came from the stars to Egypt. They were the ones that gave the people of Egypt the knowledge and wisdom. Later they left Earth back to their star homes, except for Osiris. He stayed and taught the followers. It was their duty to protect and keep the ancient knowledge he gave them until his return. The Egyptians were astronomers and fully understood that the stars were the map to the great god Osiris and the afterlife. And followers would secretly come together in their homes to discuss the possibility of the return of Osiris. They believed that the second coming of Osiris would herald a new age for mankind. They believed that when the tomb was discovered and the seal was broken, a signal was transmitted to the visitors. They calculated and estimated the time it would take for the electromagnetic signal to reach the constellation of Orion. They figured that they could return no earlier than April 23, 1985. With that time frame in mind, the group left Russia and took off to Egypt. Never to return. The only remains left behind of their meeting with the visitors was a newspaper clippage found in the KGB archives of a group of tourists disappearing in the middle of the night in Egypt, 1985. And one home movie project with film. This film showed the group in front of the pyramid at night. It shows a light appearing in the sky, the group dropping to their knees in prayer the light becoming brighter and then nothingness. A daughter of parents that were part of this group was shown the 